This is Public Resource. Hello, I'm Carl Malamud. On today's multicast, we're going to look at the rule of law, the basis of our system of government, the foundation of the Temple of Justice. Lord Tom Bingham, the late great Lord Chief Justice of the United Kingdom and one of the preeminent jurists of our time, said there were three prongs to the rule of law. The first prong is, of course, that the law shall be written down and written down before the fact that we don't make up the law as we go along, we make the law first. We are, as they used to say, we are an empire of laws, not a nation of people. Well, what they said was an empire of laws, not a nation of men, and what they meant was nation of white men, but you get the point. The second prong is promulgation. And here at Public Resource, this is where we live. Our mission is to make the law more widely available. You can't have a secret law. You can have guidelines that are perhaps restricted in view for security reasons, and that's still a written rule, but it isn't a promulgated law. When you don't promulgate the law, it can't be a law of general applicability. Promulgation is where I live, it's what I do, and while that is necessary, it is not sufficient. It is general applicability that is the third prong. Are the laws fair? And do they apply to all equally? If women or people of color are specifically or even implicitly denied a right that is available to others, then even if you promulgate that law, you do not have the rule of law. If access to education is a matter of the color of your skin, not the content of your character, then you do not have the rule of law. If men are allowed to vote and women are not, it is not a law of general applicability. Public resource lives in between the creation of the law and the requirement of general applicability that asks if the laws are just and equal and fair and proper, if the laws reflect the society we wish to be. We live in between the sausage factory and that shining city on the hill. The middle part seems like it should be easy. The two other ends of this pipeline are certainly hard, but promulgation has proven to be hard as well. At Public Resource, we believe edicts of government need to be more widely available, not just to read, but to repeat. Our fight is not just about your right to read the law, it is about our right, our collective right, to speak the law, to transform the law, to better inform ourselves and our fellow citizens of our rights and of our responsibilities, because ignorance of the law is no excuse. The right to know the law so as not to be ignorant, as ignorance of the law is no excuse. The right to speak the law so as to inform our fellow citizens. The right to know and speak the law is the underpinning of government in ancient and modern times. The right to know and speak the law is the foundation of the doctrine of the rule of law. When we fail to live up to the rule of law, we have failed as a democratic society. Despots may make excuses about extraordinary times or states of emergency, but those reasons are given sheepishly and accepted grudgingly, as we all know that a government that fails to live by the rule of law is one that will face, eventually, the springtime of revolt. As John F. Kennedy said, those who make peaceful revolution impossible will make violent revolution inevitable. Those revolutions have in fact been inevitable, and they go far back in time. In the early days of the Roman Republic, the commoners rose against their aristocratic masters and demanded that the laws by which they would be judged should be made known. 
When the aristocrats resisted, preferring to impose the law arbitrarily, the people quit the city of Rome, leaving the city defenseless and without workers to keep it running. The Great Secession led in 450 BC to the promulgation of the 12 tables of law, which were inscribed on bronze tablets and placed in the agoras for all to read. All citizens were expected to read and know the law. Indeed, when the Gauls burnt the city in 390 BC and the tablets were destroyed, all the school children were able to recite them from memory and they were easily reconstructed. That the law shall be written down and promulgated for all to know was a universal value. In Greece, the laws of Salon were inscribed on wooden cylinders and placed in the markets. Aristotle stated in politics that the rule of law is preferable to that of any individual. He who bids the law rule may be deemed to bid God and reason alone rule. But he who bids man rule adds an element of the beast, for desire is a wild beast and passion perverts the minds of rulers. Even when they are the best of men, the law is reason unaffected by desire. In India, Ashoka the Great ruled from 269 BC to 231 BC and inscribed the Code of the Dhamma on 50-foot pillars of stone and posted those edicts throughout the land, declaring in Edict Number 4 that there should be uniformity in law and uniformity in sentencing. Ashoka appointed Dhamma officers who went out into the provinces reading the edicts aloud of the people and helping them to understand his laws. That the law should be known to all was fundamental, but equally important was that the law should not be for sale. When the barons of England confronted King John in 1215 on the meadow of Runnymede, one of their chief complaints was that access to the courts had become a matter of access to money and that judgments were for sale to those who chose to pay for them. This led to the most long-lasting provision of Magna Carta, one still in force in the United Kingdom and many other common law jurisdictions, including in the United States. Article 40 famously says, To no one will we sell, to no one will we deny or delay access to right or justice. Likewise, in Japan, the 7th century prince Shokotu recognized that access to the law and justice should not be a matter of access to money. In the 17th Article Constitution, which is also still in effect, he instructed all ministers and officials of state to observe the principles he set out in Article 5. He wrote, of complaints brought by the people, there are a thousand in one day. If in one day there are so many, how many will there be in a series of years? If the man who is to decide suits at law makes gain his ordinary motive and hears causes with a view to receiving bribes, then will the suits of the rich man be like a stone flung into water while the complaints of the poor will resemble water cast upon a stone? Under these circumstances, the poor man will not know where to take their complaints. That all people should know their duties was expressed in China in the first printed book, the Diamond Sutra, which was dedicated to universal free distribution. In the Chinese Buddhist tradition, one gains merit by copying or printing. The writing of the laws began in China in 536 BC when Jing Shu inscribed the code of punishments on a bronze tripod for all to see. Then 20 years later, a neighboring state inscribed the laws on an iron tripod. Then private citizens copied them onto bamboo. For the next millennium, the Chinese government balanced the Confucian precepts of rule by man with the codified principles of rule by law. As new governments were formed to throw off colonial and dynastic yokes, equality under the law and government by rule of law became guiding principles. The U.S. Constitution enshrined equality and due process into the fabric of the newly United States. John Adams explained in his dissertation on the canon and feudal law that the key to making this experiment in democracy work would be the participation of an informed citizenry. He said, 
Let us tenderly and kindly cherish, therefore, the means of knowledge. Let us dare to read, think, speak, and write. Let every order and degree among the people rouse their attention and animate their resolution. Let them all become attentive to the grounds and principles of government, ecclesiastical and civil, and inform citizenry requires the freedom to read and write the law. When the issue came before the U.S. Supreme Court, it ruled unanimously in Wheaton v. Peters in 1834 that the law belonged to the people, not to the government, and certainly not to private citizens, stating no reporter has or can have any copyright in the written opinions delivered by this court. The principle that the law belongs to the people was repeatedly affirmed. In Banks v. Manchester in 1888, the Supreme Court rejected copyright claims over state court opinions. In Vec v. Southern Building Code Congress in 2002, the Fifth Circuit of the Court of Appeals rejected copyright claims over model building codes that were incorporated into law into Texas, stating, Public ownership of the law means precisely that the law is in the public domain for whatever use the citizens choose to make of it. In the 20th century, governments all over the world have repeatedly reaffirmed the importance of rule of law and of fundamental human rights, which includes the right to know what our governments require of us. This right has been particularly important in the formation of the European Union. Article 15 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union emphasized the right of access to documents of the Union's institutions. The Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union guarantees a right of access to documents. The Treaty of Amsterdam firmly reaffirmed this principle, stating in Article 1, the Union is founded on the principles of liberty, democracy, respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms, and the rule of law, principles which are common to the member states. The courts in Europe have repeatedly reaffirmed these principles. In the United Kingdom, for example, in Blackpool v. Locker in 1948, the King's Bench refused to enforce regulations that were not available for the public to read. In Father Gill v. Monarch Airlines in 1981, the House of Lords stated that the need for legal certainty demands that the rules by which the citizen is bound should be ascertainable by him. In Sunday Times v. United Kingdom in 1979, the European Court of Human Rights stated that the law must be adequately accessible. The citizen must be able to have an indication that is adequate in the circumstances of the legal rules applicable to a given case. The rule of law unites our world around a basic truth, that all human beings have basic rights. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights, signed in 1948, states in Article 19, Everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. The rights of speech and expression are fundamental to any Declaration of Human Rights. The right of access to justice is equally fundamental. There can be no human rights in any meaningful sense if we limit who is allowed to read the law and who is allowed to speak it. Human rights must begin with all citizens knowing their duties and their rights under the law. From the Twelve Tables of Rome and the Ashokan Edicts of India, the rule of law has stood the test of time and is a prerequisite for our modern democracy. It is an age-old rule, and it is a modern rule, and it is a rule any democracy must embrace.
Only if the law is truly free and available can we expect people and institutions to obey the law, to know their rights under the law, and to evaluate and participate in the work of improving the law. Only if the law is accessible to all can we truly say that a society is governed by the rule of law. The law must be easily available to all people. Access to the legal system and the texts that make up the law should not be bought, sold, licensed, and rationed. People must have the right, the unfettered right, to read the law. People must also have the right to communicate the provisions of law to others, to speak the law. When Justice Stephen Breyer said, if a law isn't public, it isn't a law, he was expressing something basic and fundamental about justice and democracy. The law is the raw material of our democracy. The law is the operating system of our society. Code is law, and law is code. Don't let anybody deny you the right to read and know the law. Don't let anybody tell you that justice is for sale. Read the law and make it better. You own your government. The rule of law is the rule of the people, by the people, we the people. Thanks for listening. This is Carl Malamud for Public Resource. Our work at Public Resource is made possible by a generous grant from Arcadia. Arcadia, a charitable fund of Lisbeth Rousing and Peter Baldwin. Additional support provided by Alexander McGillivray, the El Baz Family Foundation, Cyrus Capital Partners, the Kale Austin Foundation, Stuart Butterfield, Justia, and from contributions from citizens like you. Thank you for your support. Our work at Public Resource would not be possible without pro bono legal support from some of the best lawyers in the world. Many thanks to the Electronic Frontier Foundation, the leading nonprofit defending digital privacy, free speech, and innovation for 30 years, EFF. Many thanks also to Fenwick and West, Goldstein and Russell, Morrison and Forster, the Chambers of Fred P. Logue, the Chambers of Sri Salman Khurshid, the Chambers of Sri Jabahar Raja, Mr. David Halperin, Calliope Law, Duri Tangri, Davis Wright Tremaine. We thank these fine lawyers for their dedication to the rule of law. Public Resource is a 501c3 nonprofit corporation with headquarters in the state of California and dedicated to the principle that access to knowledge is a human right.